Welcome to On The Chain. This is Jeff here with co-host Chip. What's going on, Chip? Good to see you on tonight. As always, it's been like 24 hours. Man, Ripple XRP, the crypto space is boiling over, man. It's getting ready to take off. The one great thing about this is that crypto is creating a new generation of wealth creation. It's so amazing. So all I say, Chip, is be prepared for great things. Be prepared for greater things because XRP is the new era of wealth. Man, and it's it's exciting. It's exciting stuff. Exciting to be here. Lots of great things. Some news on the SEC front, I think. So we'll go over that as well. Who's the SEC? Anyway, let's do it. Hmm. Welcome to On The Chain. All right. Welcome um, to what On The is, Chain. Uh, man, I want to give a big time. shout out to all the, uh, the old time followers of On The Chain. I saw Tina Holland here. Yeah, Mama Lacey. Tina. Mama Lacey. We've got Matt LaRoche. LaRoche. Um, and there's a few others. Uh, that have been here we're talking about like way John way back Doe. and they're already here with us so tuned in ready to go and oh, everybody else some of the those that jumped in here first big shout out to hans loaded and van life biker hans loaded yeah by the way hans uh van life sent uh, something over today which is uh i'll get, read something he always sends us good stuff which i always like but Jeff, I wanted to just unpack this right here because this is kind of like uh, it happened a couple hours ago. But let's right, just kind of unpack that, this. Before we get Please to that, let it. me just give a quick shout out to permission. By the way, for everyone that's here right now and everyone tuning in after, Charlie Silver, CEO of Permission.io, will be here with us tomorrow night. We're excited to have him on with us. That guy, he is an entrepreneur that is really outstanding and just very, uh, you know, uplifting when you see people that are builders in the space with a long history in the entrepreneurial world um, has created some amazing companies. And so we'll hear about that tomorrow night. But what is Permission.io, you ask? I heard you ask someone out there, permission, what is permission.io? It's uh, so check this out. You know, when you're browsing around the internet, you run into all these ads. It's your data. They're making money off of you. You know how much money you make when you watch those ads on Google and everything else? Nothing. But check out permission.io. You can download a, download a browser extension. Allows you to monetize your data every so often. That permission.io browser extension will say, Hey, you want to watch this video? You say, Yeah, let me check out this video. You watch it and you get to earn the ask token. That's A S K token. You can huddle that token, you can spend that token, and you can watch that token grow in value like the rest of the crypto space is. And for many, just engaging with the ask token is maybe the only crypto experience they have to date. So it's really outstanding. If you want to check it out, go into the description below and check out more about that. And so Chip. Dropped it in maybe, there, man. Dropped, dropped it in there. And you guys there click on that link. That's a special link for Moss. You guys click on there. You guys get a bonus 100 ASK. And then also the show does as well. So it's a, kind of a win-win for everybody. But check it out. Wake your neighbors and phone your friends and uh, text everybody that you know. Because I'll tell you what, it's for people sitting on the fence, it's the easiest way to earn crypto. Jeff, what do you think about that? I like that. And big shout out to Henny coming in from Belgium. Man, Belgium's got some good beer. The best beer, man. Some of the best beer in the world, man. Especially and those. Got, and we got Cutter from Yorkshire. Yorkshire. I have a Yorkshire uh, football jersey, by the way. Should wear it one of these nights. Yeah, you should. Actually, sorry, it's York City. Close enough, whatever. Um, so let's talk about this. Let's unpack this. This is uh, crypto law. Obviously, John Deaton behind this. But breaking, government watchdog group files a lengthy uh, Freedom of Information Act, otherwise known as FOIA request, demanding access to internal SEC documents and records targeting Jay Clayton, William Hinman, Mark Berger over potential conflicts of interest on crypto while in office and i will uh i will open this up as well here let's open that up in the other one we'll take a look we write today seeking information regarding the appearance of conflicts of interest by former high level officials at the sec relating to cryptocurrencies it's in the public interest that the government's emerging regulatory approach to cryptocurrencies 
is based on objective legal principles without the appearance that conflicted SEC officials may be picking cryptocurrencies winners and losers based on their personal financial interest. The ways in which these former SEC officials declared whether particular cryptos were securities and thus subject to the SEC regulation raises public integrity concerns. Transparency from the SEC is the only way to ensure accountability to the public in light of this. And we're filing this FOIA request to seek the facts. What do you think about this so far, Jeff? Well, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, because if you want to get to the, the bottom of the truth, you know, the, the point that I like about this is that taking it to the SEC, regardless of who's there, you know what, we deserve to see the honest truth of all the communication. What was in the minds of certain powers that be when they made certain statements about Bitcoin or made certain statements about Ethereum? And then took those statements and bottled them up and kind of uh, said, hey, those are our personal opinions. Those aren't uh, official opinions of the SEC. Yet we still see so many talking about that. It seems like that was more official capacity, official opinion of the SEC, while the SEC is still spinning out of control uh, with this professor from MIT. <laughs> Jeff, I'm surprised you mentioned uh, MIT. So thank you for mentioning that. So it's just anybody doesn't know what a freedom of information. So this is FOIA.gov. This is the governing body. This is the place where you would do a uh, freedom of information request. And the basic function of the FOIA request is to ensure that informed citizens vital to the functioning of a democ democratic society. So I can help you determine if filing a FOIA request is the best option for you. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, so this is where the, the whole idea is that there's supposed to be transparency with the democratic uh, elected, duly elected government for the people, by the people, meaning that we also, as the people, have access. And of course, they have this, they might call it something different in, in other countries, but because it's a government agency, we should be able to go in there and grab the goods. And this is why it's a little bit different than, let's say, Ripple asking for communication. This is a watchdog group, and this is it here, right here. It's called Empower Oversight. It's, it's called Empower Oversight. There you go. Whistleblowers, and they do research as well. And um, again, this is the official sort of request right here that they went out and released that uh, crypto law and John Deaton really simplified. The way in which these former SEC, and I'll continue with it, the way in which these former SEC officials declared whether particular cryptocurrencies were securities and thus subject to regulation, transparency from the SEC, the only way to ensure accountability to the public in light of this, we're filing this FOIA request, seek facts. Letter demands a wide range of records and communications from Hinman, Clayton, Berger, outside entities like Simpson, Thatcher, One River, and the uh, Ethereum um, Alliance. And the FOIA letter also seeks records of any discussions between the target officials in the SEC Office of Ethics Council about their potential employment or, in Hinman's case, continued payments from Simpson Thatcher. That's the law firm where he was employed and he was getting ongoing payments. And there was, they were talking with the Ethereum Foundation, I believe. So there's something, there's something about that whole thing. And then the question, uh, is, the question is though, Chip, if there's anything wrong with that, because he wasn't hiding it. It was out in the open. You know, so if it's out in the open, you know, the question is, is there a conflict of interest? Between well, you know what's what weird. he's doing, what he's saying. I'm still, I'm still a little bit, you know, vague on where the conflict of interest is. Well, here's the thing: bank robberies happen in open. They're in the open. Anybody can watch them. If you're lucky enough to be in a bank when they rob it, then you can go ahead and get robbed too. So that's open. So the conflict of interest is working for a government body while still employed through a public sector. You know, when Trump became president, he had to relinquish all control of his of his corporations because there's some sort of implied um, you know, you, you don't want, you don't want something benefit him benefiting personally or any government official, um, benefiting personally. And if there was some improprieties going on where Simpson Thatcher was representing somebody in the, uh, in the crypto community, he's getting paid 14, 15 million dollars as a result. I would see that as a major conflict of interest, uh, whether it's open or not, whether it's declared or not, you don't go work for a regulatory body of the SEC, you take a uh, sabbatical 
uh, a leave of absence from your law firm so that there isn't any improprieties so that you're not doing so there can't you can say whatever say like well look i wasn't at the law firm at the time they can say well but, you were advising people okay they can say what they want but he was actively still employed and there was some things that that's where they're calling the impropriety well yeah but i think there's a distinction too and that's where we have to look into the rules and uh, and regulations of that employment because he was hired uh into government he wasn't elected into government you know if you're elected into government it's a little bit of a, a distinction versus you're hired to do a specific job or represent a certain agency you know uh, whether you know if it's full-time part time if he still has ownership stake i think the question would be you know beyond if he was still working so if he was hired on and he's saying, I'm going to give you my full time commitment for one year or two years during this appointment period, um, and he's still working as an attorney, I would say there's an issue. But if he maintains ownership in said law firm, whereas he has a one year or two year appointment, I don't know if that's a conflict. Um, I don't remember the specifics of it. There's something going on yeah. there, man. There's right, something going on. Susan Thatcher had some ties to the crypto community. And yeah. uh, to me, that's a major conflict of interest. You're at a regulatory government agency that cracks down on this stuff. It's calling uh, potential cryptocurrencies, um, you know, securities. Like, hey, there, this is a security. And then the only one you choose, like, huh, yeah, well, you know, maybe Ether is not a security. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, that, maybe it was one at a time, but maybe not. And then these said government officials end up working, going to work for crypto agencies. So the impropriety there in the scamville is that, oh, so they kind of set them up or position them because, you know, when you look at when you look at some of the other things and I will get into another tweet here that kind of like outlays this. It's an older tweet and I cannot remember who had sent this over, but I think this lays it out pretty well. Let me see if I can find it here, Jeff. Go ahead and go ahead and. Um, discuss the finer points on that yeah. well here's one here from Matt LaRoche this happened with silver investigation of manipulation as well the investigation guy ended up uh, at the law firm used by the banks involved in investigation as their defense lawyer so there's a lot of things that kind of happen you know and so there there's always a fine line and I think this is you know one of the main issues when we delve into the political aspect and government employment is whether or not somebody, you know, whether or not there's a requirement of the government employee to uh, forego ownership and ownership stake in any company. Uh, but I think there's also a distinction between an, a short term appointment and a full time job. I think an appointment yeah. is looked at, you know, differently. It's almost like a, a part time gig that you're working full time but it's for a short period of time and you take a hiatus from your career. Um, so if this case, he's not going to relinquish ownership in his law firm in order to take an appointment, that doesn't make any sense. You know, so, and the fact is he's going to have certain statements uh, as he moves forward. But the one thing, and so having the FOIA request, I think is the most critical thing of all. So regardless, but you can see that there's some, you know, possible, you know, misunderstanding because we don't know. You know, we don't know right. if there was something, you know, nefarious or something not. Then we don't know what the actual That's why. rules were. And so we need the FOIA. Thank right. God for FOIA. And thank God that uh, you know, that you know, Deaton is out there, you know, pushing this forward uh to make that happen, you know, because we need stuff like that. Also, the the guy that runs the uh the watchdog group came out and said they have 20 uh business days to respond, right? Okay, well, they had the SEC had 20 days to respond to uh, John Deaton's motion to intervene. How'd that go? Still waiting for a response, right? So they can respond within 20 days. That doesn't mean they have to comply. And I know of certain FOIA requests that took over four years. They kept slow walking it and we'll get to it and we can't find it because this is what agencies do when they're uh, called out. Now I know who sent this to me. This was Van Life Biker sent this to me. And I found this to be very interesting. This is an old tweet and Van Life, great job. I think he's in the chat tonight. Hopefully you can see this, but uh, yeah, there, uh, but then I just tweeted the party's current degree, which should be sealed on Slack. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, we'll get into that as well. Yeah, Phylon tweeted that too. We'll jump into that. 
So this is from Santiago Velez. He said, "I this came out on December 23rd of 2020. He said, you know, I don't normally connect dots, but hey, it's almost Christmas. Let's have some fun. Mr. Jay Clayton was once a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell LLP, where he was a member of the firm's management committee and the co-head of the firm's corporate practice, okay? Sullivan and Cromwell advises some of the largest firms and investment banks in the world, one of which is Goldman Sachs. The firm happens to be very familiar with global banking infrastructure, including cross-border commodity swaps and even swift messaging. Of course, he puts all, cites all of the uh, um, you know, backup for this. And then at the same time, Goldman Sachs advances a cross-border payments initiative in early of 2020. Hmm. There it is. Goldman Sachs advances cross-border. There's the article there. Santiago Velez continues. SAP Ariba is the primary arm of the GS and Goldman Sachs investment. The tech forward and secure and cross-border global payments capabilities of Goldman Sachs will be made available at SAP Ariba Solutions. Hmm. Then he says, uh, there's the Goldman Sachs right there, adds global payments to SAP. There's another backup. Super interesting, huh? Imagine that. So, you know, and then it goes on here, buyers can execute cross-border and domestic payments directly in a Reba network without needing to go through manual payment and reconciliation processes. Buyers can also access more than 120 currencies at competitive rates while suppliers are paid. Okay, so, you know, is are there dots connected? You know, I don't know. I mean, it, maybe. But the bottom line is it looks kind of like, it doesn't look great. But are they bad um, dots? I mean, this is how the world goes around. You know, if you think about it, you have to look for the you have to look for the impropriety improprieties. So, if you can find impropriety someplace, it needs to be called out. You know, there's laws on the books that make oh, sure course. these improprieties don't continue. However, as we know, as you start connecting dots, and just because you know you have things going on within a similar agency, we're talking about you know, multi, multi-billion dollar agencies and, and organizations that have ownership stake in lots of different entities. And there's a lot of different things moving around and you can always try to connect a bunch of dots. But again, when it comes down to it, you know, you know, you can look and say, Hey, it looks like something negative, or maybe it looks like something positive. I mean, you I'm see them developing in the space, right? Here's it's what I'm saying. Here's yeah. here's how the world works. You grease my pockets, you grease my wheels, I'll grease your wheel. That's how it really works. You give me something, I give you something. That's how it works. I hear this is like, this is just an interesting sort of a, some, I don't even call it a connection. It's just interesting in passing. He, at the same time that SAP Ariba inked the blockchain supply system with Everledger in 2017, SAP is working with Ripple at some point. Learn first, then copy. The plot thickens. Um, then he says, so let me get to the article penned by John Bertrad, who was at SAP in 2014. And then he talks about, hey, every bank I get from a call lately seems to ask, what should we be doing about blockchain? This is back in 2014. It's also interesting that who has an ownership stake in Everledger, Digital Currency Group, owned by other none, none other than Barry Silber. Wow, small world. Also on the board, Glenn Hutchins and Larry Summers. Look at the gangs all here. It feels and, like and a And that's, a, that's another good point, though. Look at the board seats. So think about, and some of this stuff, it, it goes on kind of in this, in this gray area. You know, so you have all these involvement, all these different board seats. So many times in, in different places of power, you know, you get board seats. And you sit in board seats with other board members that are also in big positions of power. Because when you're in these boards, then all of a sudden you get a lot of commingling and conversation and other projects will spin off of it. Um, where you start having issue with many of these board positions is when you put someone that has zero qualification uh, to be on a board, or you put someone in charge of uh, trade deals in a country that they have no experience in, or in uh, commodity products like oil that they have no business being in, you know, and then you start connecting certain dots of money flow, that becomes very nefarious. But when you start seeing this, like you said, this is kind of how the world works in big places, you know, and you get all these board positions, a lot of intermingling, and you'd be amazed at how much intermingling there is. I mean, it's, oh, of course. I think it's unbelievable. You know, oh, no, there is. You know. Of course, but you know it's too big to fail, and we certainly can't prosecute. And banks that launder hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars are like, well, you know, it happens. 
But me, meanwhile, you find one bad actor in crypto, and then you're gonna, you're gonna cast the whole crypto crowd in there. Rob McDermott says the government corruption is broader, is a borderline depressing to look around crypto. I, for one, am just exhausted. These damn elite crooks. Of course, he phrased it a little bit differently there, but yeah, crypto industry needs a lobby with 11 billion. There's Corey Westing. So, but here it is, Jeff. Look, here, look, the gang's all here like a family reunion. The SEC. Larry and Goldman's man, Gary. So nice to see people getting together, right? Well, I like hanging out. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Wow, it's just a coincidence, Jeff. All this is coin coincidence, coincidence, right. as they say. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? There's Gary Cohn. There's, you know, meanwhile, back at the home base, Goldman plays, makes a play in the cross border. Fascinating. And you go to the CNBC article. Huh? That sounds familiar. Where have I heard integration services for digital assets and Goldman? Well, Circle we know else from Goldman, and his name is Gensler. There you go. There you go. And it circle raises 50 million with Goldman Sachs support. Wow, this is getting good. Pull a string. You never know what you can find. There you go. Right there. Free cross-border payments, European growth, product features. Circle. We'll talk about circle there. All right, I'm going to stop now. Just bored on a day off. Decided to make a point about creating havoc and speculation on Twitter or the motivations of humans I've never met nor talked to because that's how Twitter does. We like drama. Fun time, folks. And that's all it really is. A bunch of historical sort of coincidences that Jeff refers to as co-mingling. But again, so what? Take the FOIA request. Let's see if they get the FOIA request. Three times a judge asked, uh, asked the SEC to provide documents. Yeah. They ignore them every time. So, you know, is it the SEC is too cool? They they just don't have to comply. They don't care. They're, just, they're way too cool. I mean, apparently they think something's going on. So anyway, Van Life, appreciate that. That was a nice little gold nugget you dug out from seven months ago i really appreciate that it's fun to look at jeff and i'm not saying something oh look at that I'm, i've never been that conspiracy guy well wait a minute maybe i am but no but so there's some weird things that go on alleged bad actor chip <laughs> alleged wait, bad actor <laughs> hmm, alleged 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 now that's jeff with the uh, uh allegations i'm just saying that like the weird stuff happens it's interesting to unpack does it mean anything i don't know we'll find out but the FOIA request to me is exciting because I like any watch group. Now, here's the funny thing. What's going on with the Blockchain Association? Mum's the word. They're lobbying over there. They're talking to people on Capitol Hill. They're not oh. saying a damn word. These supposed two to three lobby groups that are supposed to be representing crypto. It turns out they've pretty much gone to the dogs because they're not doing anything. They weren't outspoken about the crypto thing. They weren't raising all the money and funds they raised. That's weird. Oh. I don't see any FOIA requests coming from them. That's a good point. I, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up because I found. You know, we got a uh, we got this nice email newsletter uh, from the Defiant, and I thought this this article was really kind of spot on. And you're talking about the lobby group and blockchain association. He actually mentioned blockchain association in this article, <laughs> and the point of this, which is really amazing. There is no political voice to the millions of crypto users in the U.S. Silence, Spot right? On. Nobody, no real political voice to everyone that's out there mobilizing. And as you get into this, so they spoke with this Ryan uh, Selka, CEO and founder of Masari, uh, which is one of the most popular crypto data and research companies. Now, Ryan's been very vocal about crypto regulation. Um, obviously, we know it impacts everybody. Um, but what look he says here, the space is missing a grassroots entity that gives a voice to the millions of crypto users in the US that are so energy that so energetically came to life against this bill, the infrastructure bill and the crypto bill that they shoved into it. Now I look at this, I'm reading this, and I, I don't know what the outcome is. Maybe the outcome is that Ryan's starting this grassroots lobby group. Then I look at on the chain, I'm like, what is on the chain? You know, on the chain is like the perfect grassroots lobby group because we have the smartest people from all over the crypto world that are right here you know all from all over the world that are right here you know following us and commenting so we got some outstanding people chip and then i get oh, into no. it you know you go down through here and maybe we're not going to get the rest of the article no we are okay so <laughs> um check it out so he says so the quick background is there's a bipartisan infrastructure bill. <laughs> bipartisan. Uh, uh, the nut jobs, uh, bipartisan. Yeah, uh, the clowns. Uh, let's see here. They had expanded the reporting requirements for crew. Okay, we, we all know what was in it. 
um, the point that I like this, uh, it was blocked by a lone senator, 87 year old senator from Alabama. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, here's somebody that's been around, you know, been around pretty much like, you know, from the beginning, from the beginning where all this stuff started, you know, back during the, uh, the Howie test era. He claimed you know, that he so, did. Remember that tweet he put out, Jeff, we read here uh, the other day where he said, well, it wasn't me. I mean, come on, dude. I mean, you were stood up there and you, you derailed go. the whole bill. Exactly. No, here we go. So there we have is. the Blockchain Association and a couple of other behind the scenes <sighs> corporate sponsored lobbying group, right? So they're behind the scenes. They're for they're corporate sponsored for corporate, not for anybody. He said, but there's no voice to the tens of millions of crypto users in the U.S. that, frankly, I don't think the Senate or Congress in general really appreciated until this past week. And this is exactly what we've been talking about the past couple of days is that it was so loud that the SEC has completely not appreciated the fact that there's this massive, you know, groundswell of XRP supporters around the world and in the US that won't sit still. Right. The Senate also underappreciated the people, right? And and he brings this up which I think is just, you know, tremendous because this is 100% spot on. Hit the wrong button. And it's 100% you know, the case, Chip. The Blockchain Association does nothing for the people. It's not a voice of the people. It just isn't. Well, isn't Ron Hammond over there? Is it? Didn't he go over there? He is, yeah. Ron so, Hammond uh, is at the blockchain, but it's corporate. They're worried about uh, corporate stuff, you know? Yeah, they're not worried about anything. They're worried about where where is their next uh, free launch and who's going to, which are they going to raise money? It's like a politician. You know, one of the things I want one of the, I remember a politician said it. They said they were so shocked when they got the Washington because they found out that 80% of your time is working on your next re-election campaign and raising <laughs> funds. So what do you think the blockchain association <laughs> spends their time? Okay, where's our next where's our next grant coming so we can expand more people? It's like, you know, it's like in a corporate setting, you have a meeting to discuss a meeting. Okay, well, that's really not very, you know, productive. Just have the meeting. These are the three points. You hit the three points and you're done. You don't need to go on for hours. You don't need to talk about things that have nothing to do. You keep the agenda items. You go boom, boom, boom. You get through them and you're out of there, right? But no, no, you got to have a meeting. This is what they have to do. They And they pass a bill in Congress so that they can talk about creating a committee that can talk about crypto. How about you pass the token taxonomy? How about you bring that out of committee and you bring it on to the floor for a vote? And you've got bipartisan, true bipartisan support, not this BS stuff they keep, yeah, you know, bantering about. And that's what they do. But no, no, you got to have a conversation to have a conversation about having a conversation. This is how silly it is, Jeff. It is silly. Oh. It's silly. Silly talk. Boom, boom, boom. JL XRP, by the way, is from Michigan. Just gonna All right, JL. Out there. Yep. Good to hear you, man. Jeff and I so, formerly both of Michigan. Yeah. So check this out. We've got. Um, on the chain live, do you like pomp and sell pizza boxes for a grant? <laughs> no, man, do, do not sell out. I mean, pomp was trying to do a good thing, but man, there's going to be memes from now to the end of time about him selling the pizzas, the pizza boxes with him. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things, don't, whatever you do in life, try not to do stuff where you create an endless meme of yourself just because of your own stupidity. You know, it's kind of like when you're doing some heavy work outside or you do something that's really physical. Your motto is no blood, right? You just don't want to hurt yourself and you don't want to accidentally kill yourself. One of those other things you don't want to do, Jeff. That's probably but, a good um, thing. It's probably a really good thing. I can tell you, I can tell you've got another uh you got another article over there uh getting ready to to, to uh boil. Uh, I'm just closing them down. Closing up shop. That's it. Game over. That's it. Look, check check this out. So have you ever thought um uh, about We've talked about fractional ownership and I've mis mislabeled the term multiple times, fractional shares uh, in stock. So there's a yeah. few companies that have done that, but fractional ownership of tokenized collectibles. Now we see with NFTs and mm. to fractional uh, share ownership of real estate. Now I was thinking about, I was reading this article and you know, you know all about, you know, baseball and baseball cards and all of that. So Honus Wagner. Now, many people you probably are not familiar with baseball cards. Card. And so this Honus Wagner, a couple of years ago, the top top 
sold for like 1.5, 1.6 million. Then it sold for like 2 million. There's not a lot of these around. This is a, a tobacco cart. So I believe it used to come in a cigarette pack back in the day. But this Honus Wagner, it's a tiny little car too. These little uh, tobacco cards, they're tiny. I have a and, photo. It's and it's, dude, it's crazy. 1909, right? So um, I, I got to learn about baseball cards years ago when I had an eBay store and we used to sell stuff on eBay and I helped somebody sell a collection of ridiculously priced uh, baseball cards, a baseball card collection. It was amazing, right? And, you know, and, and I look at some of these things so anyhow, so this one ship just sold for five, oh wait, oh no, check it out. So a Mickey Mantle card, a uh, Mickey Mantle rookie card uh, was in that 52 to 56 time period as well, worth a ton of money, $5.2 million on a Mickey Mantle. But this Honus Wagner sold for $6.6 .6 million, right? So you start thinking, Chip, about the collectible space, you know, like, Man, the collectible space has got to be phenomenal. Now, could you imagine having fractional share ownership of a Honus Wagner that's worth $6.6 .6 million? So I started looking around and I'm like, man, is there anything out there that allows you to invest and do some of this uh, fractional share ownership in baseball cards or trading cards or anything like that? And then I stumbled on this, Chip. And then nothing. And like, I mean, there's like nothing else. I was shocked. I mean, there might be something else out there, but here's something. And they have something called a card token. And I haven't looked a lot into it enough to really dig into it. They have 500 plus cards, but I don't know. You know, to me, it just seems like maybe they don't have enough. I wonder how much they have under, you know, total value. They have 100,000 cards traded, 17,000 plus users on dibs. Um, I just thought this was cool. You know, it's kind of like a side note to all the serious stuff that's going on. But could you imagine just have, you know, being able to invest and saying, hey, I own a part of this or, you know, I own a uh, Van Gogh and you're like, oh, where do you hang it? Well, it's in the gallery or it's in, you know, being held in some storage, but I own a fraction of that Van Gogh. So as it goes up in value, what are your thoughts on that? Very cool or just why would you want to own a fraction of something like that? Jeff, you know, I think it comes down to personal interests and, you know, I think it's like, just like anything else. Like people are like, I really like red. People are like, ah, but blue is so usable, you know, and you know, all my shirts are dark colors. I like dark colors. I like, you know, I got in trouble when I was in grade school because the teacher's like, well, what's your favorite color? And I'm like, gray. She's like, well, gray is not a color. And I'm like, but it is for me. You know, I like gray, grays. And she's like, but you know, you got to choose a color. Gray is like the, the, you know, like uh, taken away from black. It's a, transparency of black i'm like i don't care i like it you know and i've always been like a fan of gray now i will see you your baseball cards and i will raise you the nfts now listen that honus wagger some guy's been carrying that around and multiple people have been using it and then check this out jeff oh, look at that there you of go 11.8 million dollars at sotheby's okay 11 uh, let's just call it 12 million okay can you can you spot me the 200,000 there i mean please eight uh, there you go some nut job bitmap for that, like for that little bitmap for that little bitmap that amassed that i want to just flush down the toilet i never want to see it again i'll be honest with you but there you go that's what it was and then like let's take a look over here and let's just drill down on the top 15 most expensive nfts there's something called right. harry that sold for 888,888. and you're probably thinking okay that was a collaboration between uh dj steve aoki and antonio tudisco okay that was sold in march of 2021 then you got metarit that sold for nine hundred thousand dollars. now here's what's funny about this this artist is unknown they call this artist the satoshi of the nft art okay so there you go i don't know what it is but somebody whoever pack is the name they call him satoshi of crypto art right what number 13 coming in at a big whopping one million dollars a rose is a rose is a rose unless it's an nft rose and some numbskull buys it for one million dollars that's what we're looking at we're looking at a beautifully backlit rose that sold for a million dollars okay they have more crypto than brains 
And then this one here, this is a CryptoPunk. This is 4156, which I happen to go. like this one. This is a pretty cool one because of the little bandana and stuff. This one sold for approximately $1.25 million. 650 ETH. <laughs> yeah. Did you buy that one, Chip? Is that, I is did that not. yours? No, I don't have that much ETH, I'll be honest. And uh, 24 of the punks are apes. And that's one of the apes with the cool blue bandana oh, on his head. Go. Got crypt- so we got this crypto punk. This sold for $1.3 million. And that is Sinead O'Connor right there, Jeff, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, yeah, that's just, uh, I don't know what that is, but there you go. I mean, a couple of lines and a squiggle, and there you go. They're $1.3 million. Uh, that's a, And then we've uh, got, now it says, what's interesting about 6487, it's not part of a rare set. It's one of 3,840 female punks, meaning that hundreds of other very similar images are available for purchase. So someone nice. gets something so similar. That it's not even rare or interesting. There you go. I sound like I'm uh, listening to the beginning of an auction. Lot sixty four eighty seven. Not so interesting. As Coming in at number lot. ten, Jeff. We have auction winner picks. The name one point three three million dollars. Uh, I'm going to be honest. Jeff, I don't know what it is. No. <laughs> it's one of it's one of those uh, you know ink things where you click, you open it up. Uh, you know, know what, what it is? is? It's an ant. I don't know. I mean, what do you guys I look see at? It, it's picture? mandibles. You see the mandibles, the jaws in the front, it's a little antennae at the top, his eyes. See. That's what it is. It's an ant. It's called, I don't even know what, what do they even call it? I don't know. But anyway, that's number nine. We have Axie ant. Infinity Virtual Game Genesis Estate. So this is looks like a piece of land, a virtual land there. Nine Genesis nice. plots for 1.5 million. Kind of cool. Uh, and then you got CryptoPunk 6965, which is another one of the apes, so the 24 apes, but he's wearing kind of a cool hat. And then we've got in there, uh, Jeff, Semers. Check out an egg. Eight, eight bit developers from the oh, 80s God, are crying yes. in the background. <laughs> oh, <laughs> crying, weeping openly. <laughs> like, this is They're like. They're on their deathbeds going, why? Why? <laughs> How do we co- collapse this? <laughs> this is called the best I could do for 1.65 million. And Jeff, that's a I really know it is the Simpsons. But... It's kind of the Simpsons. If you're I mean, I, I guess that's so far. Are you kidding me? 1.65 million. It's the it's the worst drawing you've ever seen of the Simpsons. You don't know it's the Simpsons oh until you sort of recognize Bart and sort of recognize Lisa over here. Okay. Homer looks I, like I, I recognize I Homer know. and Marge right away. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but I, I had a, I had a kind of like look at this. This is called the best I could do. If that's the that's best you can do for 1.6 million, I'd like to see what the worst she could do sells for. <laughs> and see if it fetches a million dollars, right? Then we've got over here. Uh, this uh, was uh, this is Rick and Morty co-creator Justin Roiland. Yeah, okay, well whatever. Number six, we got the first Twitter tweet. This was uh, Jack Dorsey for 2.9 million, and his first tweet was just setting up my Twitter, which is TWTTR. That was on March 22nd of 2006. And then we've got uh, coming in number five, Doge. This is 16 night. This sold for $4 million. That's the Doge dog in a gold frame with the blue background. That's what that is, the Doge dog. And somebody owns it, Jeff, $4 million. They paid for it. Well, that one's kind of cool. It's in a frame. Crossroads. This looks like a, uh, yeah, this is a Beeple. Looks like a Beeple. This one sold for $6.6 million. It's got the Twitter with the little clown show there. And of course, that looks yeah, like I'm a, sorry. Anybody a big old NFTs in. That's a Trump land on the ground, loser Trump. Yeah, he's not a he's not a uh, he's what I like to refer to as a all-in leftist. Um, but a really cool um does some cool art. Then we've got here coming in Crypto Punk 7804, which is a dude smoking a pipe, which is kind of cool. I like this one too. A green dude, seven point five million dollars, well, forty two hundred ETH. No, Jeff, it's an 8-bit thing. It doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. Then we've got number two, CryptoPunk 3100. This is 7.58 million. Looks just like a dude wearing a bandana. I don't know. People in the 80s say, give me my uh, my headband back. Or that's what it looks like, a headband or something. And then, of course, the best, the top was uh, Beeple's first 5,000 days, insane. which sold for $69 million. And do you remember the criticism that he got when he sold it, Jeff? Everybody's like, I can't believe he took his money in fiat currency. Meanwhile, he opened up, started doing some development. He opened up his own NFT shop. Yeah. He opened up his own NFT platform. And he's like, hey, I'll start making the fees off of other people. Dude, $69 million. I'll be like, 
Give it to me in fiat. I'll figure out how to spend it today. <laughs> figure out how to set every, everything up for life. And whatever you're going to do, you do like like that. You know, I mean, it's great. Take a big you can take a chunk of it, put it back into crypto. It's your it's your uh, your objective, whatever you so, want to do. Jeff, I wanted to. Let, so this was I thought I found this to be outstanding, too. You know, OpenSea is like one of the NFT platforms, but really kind of came out of nowhere. Gained the note. That's where almost all these were purchased on. Look at this. Really? Well, wow. OpenSea, look at some stats. 180 NFT sales volume, $1.7 billion, Jeff. 180 D protocol revenue, 2.5% fee at $42.5 million. Yeah. That was the 2% fee. So they made $42 million off of the, the, the volume. And then you got 180 Crazy. the seller fees, $77.4 million. That's what the sellers paid, Jeff. Oh, yeah, 77.4 million. I like goes. XRP panic, man. Take that six. I, I I agree with that. Take your 69 million, put it all into Shiba because that's obviously and the way. Lose it all. Watch it and watch it. <laughs> let, watch it. Let it roll. <laughs> and let it roll. Watch it be drained, right? I mean, it's like. Go it's, all in. <laughs> so then I found these two other funny things that I thought were notable worth sharing tonight. And uh, one of them comes to us from uh, this is so. I, I love these memes right here. This is the yeah, Corey. Seen... Good to have you on tonight. Corey's going to check out Netflix. Oh, why not, man? Go right. ahead. Knock, yeah. knock yourself out. I could give you some good. Johnny Crypto is saying we need to get a uh, lemon tree NFT going. I think we will. Jeff and I are doing an NFT really series. Cool. We're talking about it. It's going to be a cool NFT series. It's going to be something that hasn't been done before. And it'll be something. Anyway, we'll. we'll and I we'll... do want a cool lemon tree NFT. Okay, there you go. Look at this right here. It's going to be awesome. Hey, I'm building a decentralized social network on Bitcoin, right? Gives you the look. On Bitcoin, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just so funny. So what I like about that is Tony um, Shang yeah, says, no, it's just a joke. It's somebody replying. To so it says, uh, if Blue Sky doesn't get built on Bitcoin, Jack's going to have some splaining to do. Dude, you're not going to build it on Bitcoin. What kind of bizarre old universe is this? this this person living in uh, anyway where do people live where do people live and we'll get into blue sky too but this one comes from uh xrp darren uh darren moore so it's like financial advisor no more than five percent of your net worth should be in crypto me i'm 99 in crypto <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, a that's, good funny. One. that's a good one job you gotta like that yeah you gotta apex like that, is wondering when you cloned my lemon tree and you can tell it's a clone. No, it's Obviously, not a clone. It might no. be a little bit more plush and bush size, but it uh, has a little bit of a dearth of lemons that are growing on the uh, on no, said lemon not, tree. There's nothing even remotely. It's a completely different lemon tree. Uh, would you, you say that I have a plethora of lemons on my lemon tree? Well, there's a lot of lemons in the back of that tree, Jeff. Don't don't let that be lost on you. You know what I mean? So one of the things he was referencing, Jeff, and I, I got to get your opinion on this if you haven't heard about it. He was talking about Blue Sky, which we've talked about here before. I don't know if you recall yeah. us talking about Blue Sky. So what is Blue Sky? You're probably asking yourself, well, Blue Sky, this one cracks me up. This is the one. This has to be. I don't even know how to say this, but Blue Sky is the Twitter arm that's developing Twitter to be decentralized. Now, they finally chose crypto developer Jay Graber to run the decentralized social media wing. Hmm. Blue Sky's new leaders worked at Zcash and more. And um, Graber contributed to Privacy Coin Project Zcash until October of 2018. And he said, "Hey, uh, I'm so I'm so excited to announce that I'll be leading Blue Sky, an initiative started by Twitter to decentralize local media." Now, Jeff, Twitter. I don't remember Blue Sky. We talked about Blue Sky. Well, there's been, remember we talked about when, uh, so there we go right here. This is uh, this is Jay Graber. She's the one who's going to be leading the whole decentralized crypto thing. Now, here's my question. Do you Not at think all what that, I thought Jay Graber would look like. Do you think, Jeff, do you think that Twitter knows that you can't ban people, you can't deplatform them in decentralization? Do you think they know that that's not a possibility in a true decentralized network or are they just using buzzwords to sound cool and hip this is the part that i'm going really with uh cool hip buzzwords efforts to decentralize efforts what effort jeff 
There are no efforts. It's either decentralized or it's not. We're going to make efforts and strides. This is what politicians do. We're making efforts and strides to decentralize Twitter. Efforts to decentralize social networks hope to structurally change the balance of power in favor of users, giving them the ability to change services easily and control their identity and data. Graber wrote hey. in a blog post in 2020. Well, hey, check this out. So Norseman has volunteered to put together an entire series of NFTs. There you and go. He's, he's calling it, I'm at a loss of words with NFTs. That's what a great a, series would that be? Could you fantastic imagine? fantastic series. And that would be your series. I'm at a loss of words for NFTs. And he could, I don't know, put different, whatever you want. I could see like broken up words, you know, people like, you know, sitting there, no words, chip face or like that. You got the chipmunk face. There you go. Yeah. That, I, I, I'm I like, like this is, is this like a joke? It. Are we becoming a parody site, Blue Sky? Because he talked about this two years ago, saying we're, we're moving in the direction. We have we created Blue Sky. Holy cow, is Twitter the slowest uh, to, to decentralize? And he says social media. doesn't say Twitter. To, to decentralize. Yep. I, I just find it laughable at best. I mean, really, it is it, it, silly. So. so here's what they say. Uh, when it comes to moderation, each instance sets its own moderation policies, either through the unilateral decisions of an administrator, centralized, or through some sort of collective vote, centralized. Uh, admins can ban entire instances, centralized, cutting off their visibility if an instance gets banned by others. Users can stop, still talk with each other, but they'll be isolated. So th th this <laughs> be is isolated of, from the rest isolated. of the Fediverse. Hello, Hello anybody. <laughs> This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of, really. Uh, Jeff, that, this is well, really cause for concern. This is the dumbest thing I've seen. From the and then yes. you can, they'll be isolated from the rest of the Isolate Fediverse. People. This happened to Gab.com, which set up an instance. These people are what are their pronouns, Jeff? Should we learn their pronouns? But you know, but you know what's cool though. You know, if nobody wants to talk to you, no one's gonna follow you, and you'll be kind of relegated, you know, to the dustbin. Well, they call they do that now. It's called uh, shadow banning, Jeff. That's what they could they, they do that now. So then no, it says, well, I'm saying the people can do it. You know, if a majority of people don't want to listen to you, they don't listen to you. Right. When we talk up, about we talk about you from their feed. We talk about decentralization, right? And then they're pretending they're going to go create a decentralized network. Then they're going to tell you why all the reasons why they're going to centralize it. That's what they're doing here. So federated social networks requires both hosting and development costs to maintain. And they're talking about Mastodon, which was a really poorly how does this run. all factor into crypto? It doesn't have anything to do with it. I'm talking about decentralization. You don't want to know why? Why? I'll show you. All right. Decentralization is freedom. Boom. See the that? only, with, the only thing you can do is decentralize back. social media. But what they're talking about is centralizing it, but calling it decentralization. That's what they're doing. And they're saying, well, and they're making all these excuses. You see, the matrix, there was matrix, and there's something... Here's the pros and cons and everything else. But the bottom line is, it's not going to become decentralized. So they're going to call it decentralization. Can you imagine if you could go in there and mess around with Bitcoin? Corruption clown series. There you go. That's another one. we got NFTs coming out of everywhere. So Matt is going to have his corruption clown series. We got Norseman. I don't know about these NFT series. Man, it's going to be great. Well, I wanted We're to take all sorts of series rolling out. Remember here. my bus, the clown show? Dude, the VW bus with all the clowns in it? Oh yeah, yeah, that was sweet. That 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 should be an NFT too, the clown show. Yeah, go into. I think so. And so, more recently, she won a grant from the Ethereum Foundation to further efforts with a project called Interrep. Hmm. Project aims to ensure accounts uh, you interact with on social media are reputable. So again, uh, when the fact checkers come out and they want to make sure that it's reputable, and they want to make sure that it's gosh darn it fair, they want it to be centralized, but they'll yell cute names and they'll say you know you know it's it's just uh look at this right yeah that anyway jeff i don't know that to me was like a parody bit right there i just i found that to be highly entertaining it was a good one what do you got over there you got something brewing looks like you got something what is this huh. nonsense which one's which nonsense is that oh yeah that i didn't really set to nominate acting cfc CFTC, Jay Rostin Benham, as official agency lead. Has he been it's doing been a good there. job or a bad job? I don't even know. I, I don't either. I, I haven't he, heard anything. I mean, he's been doing the job for, you know, since January. I mean, I don't know if he's yeah. doing it. 
We don't know if it's good or bad, but we know his chairman was pretty outspoken and said, hey, SEC step the, you know, what off? You know, you're you're stepping into our space hey, with Jeff, the crypto assets. Does this guy look familiar to you? Which one? Um, Mr. Rostin here. Look at this. He looks like uh, he'd be uh, Gensler's like son. <laughs> it's like the, the son of Gensler. Oops. I don't know. I meant to remove. No, no, no. It's go. good. It's all good. It's all good, man. I just thought that was. So this is him right here. This is his official profile. Um, yeah, I don't know if he's doing a good job. He uh, he spent a lot of time in agricultural markets, went to Georgetown, worked as proprietary equities trader in New York City. He pursued a Juris Doctorate at Syracuse University. Oh, there you go, Jeff. Uh, there you go. Went to Syracuse. During his nice. legal study of the orange. Yeah, the orange. Man. So you got acting chairman, Benham, interned. With the CFTC's Division of Enforcement in the New York Regional Office, that he went home to New Jersey. Plagiarized in his law <laughs> in Syracuse. Very, yeah, and then uh, following his time with the Bureau of Securities, acting chairman Benham practiced law in New York City. So he's a little bit well rounded. He's got some stuff. He focused on policy and legislative matters related to the CFTC and the United States Department of Agriculture. Wow. Um, and right here it says Benham's major responsibilities included. Advising uh, Senator wah, 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 wah. Exactly. <laughs> we need some sound effects. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Doc Frank, worst piece of legislation ever. Um, since joining the CFTC, uh, I think Chairman Benham had individually and his sponsor. La, 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 la. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But anyway, no. there you go. So anyway. I we wonder how he's done at the CFTC. He's been there for a little while. I don't know. But he's been pretty quiet. We haven't heard from him. Well, why isn't he outspoken about crypto? <laughs> you know, is he already losing the battle? Is he allowing, uh, you know, uh, the G-man to uh, kind of take take precedent and say the SEC is uh, has number one jurisdiction? You know, but we have some of the, you know, a chairman or a, a, a commissioner of the CFTC said, hey, this is our jurisdiction. But this guy, nothing, like zero. We haven't heard. We're going to have to start bringing him up, see where he uh, falls in the whole crypto space. Look at this, Jeff. Th find this, out. this is an, I'm sorry, I've got some non-related crypto stories, but they sort of play into the whole technology realm. This one here. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Matt LaRoche. Uh, roaming reporter Matt LaRoche chimes in and says, yes, he's also corrupt. Okay. Not, not just you. two, but. Badly. <laughs> Badly. Ooh, not a good report from Roving Reporter Matt LaRoche. Not good, uh, man. Field correspondent checks in, says no, not a good thing. I saw Jeff and I both had that moment when we read the one line and went, oh, wah, wah, same time, right? So check this out. Abu Dhabi unboxes the Middle East first quantum supercomputer. Achieving a temperature temperature 100 times colder than deep outer space is about to become possible in Abu Dhabi in, the, in August. Look at this, Jeff. What the heck is this going on? This is the uh, quantum chandelier, uh, so called for its resemblance to the light fixture. It has looping microwave communication cables that enable other computers to interact with the quantum chip within. If you get sucked into that, Jeff, you end up in the matrix somewhere, you know? Yeah, but what a great place to have, you know, right? the coldest, the coldest, uh, whatever, I don't know what that would be, you know, building on Earth, put it in the hottest place on Earth. Perfect. Good. Yeah, it makes sense, right? It kind of goes, it's, it says it's not about escaping the summer heat. Quantum physicists at the Capitals Technology Innovation Institute had begun building the Middle East's first quantum computer. It'll put the UAE on the map, be known as the entity for research on right. such a topic. And that's a big achievement for the entire Arab world. Uh, Bukas Afaki said, uh, senior researcher told The National. I thought it was pretty interesting. It says the Emirates, like Singapore or Israel, countries of comparable size, cannot depend fully on allies. They've also had to develop their own technological strategies as they have to be sovereign. Th that is fundamental. Yeah. Here, here. Look at this. How about this one here? For the brain of the supercomputer to work, the one by one centimeter chip must operate in an extremely chilled environment. Man. Holy chip. cow. Another chip. Another chip. Yeah. Chip, chip. The Emirates, like, yeah, we already read that. But it's, I don't know, I thought it was interesting, you know? I thought it's pretty cool they got a supercomputer, man. They're building it's it anyway. They're doing something like that. Something Epic Sushi says, I hope they don't mind all the ETH at once. 
<laughs> now, if you had a quantum computer, what would you do with it? I mean, would you just like try Act to crypto? solve all this stuff? Man, it'd be the greatest thing. Mine crypto. That's it. Yeah. Something like <laughs> something along the lines of that. I mean, something. I like it. I'm so happy, Jeff. Rob we got McDermott, all... only the NSA has quantum computation capabilities. I'm it was confused. the NSA and Google. Yeah. UA is really on uh and Jeff, this forward. is this is something that you uh had posted and I'm just this one's kind of this kind of kind of mystifies me too. This one is the uh Microsoft wants to use the oh, Ethereum yeah. blockchain to fight piracy. What the hell? Uh, the new software, major software developers, new plan to combat piracy relies on the transparency of block. Okay, fair enough. But Ethereum? I mean, why not? Microsoft. Windows operating system and office productivity suite have always been top well, performers. I mean, what the hell, man? That second paragraph right there. That's what I tuned into and in my comment in there. But, you know, if you look at that. Um, and their research paper with participation of researchers from Alibaba and Carnegie Mellon University. Now, I find it interesting because they want to bolster anti-piracy campaigns. <laughs> now, Alibaba obviously has a little bit of issue. Wasn't it uh, Jack Ma that all of a sudden disappears, gone, right? And then um. turns out that government owns and controls uh, controlling interest now of alibaba jack ma silent you know well, even though he came out and said hey i was on vacation or whatever yeah in the in the gulags but, but jack, uh, the I'll be, but the thing about that was is that on alibaba like in some of their like their, their website stuff you can buy it's all pirated stuff well that's the other point that, i it's guess pirated. that was my point it's all pirated right it's all pirated and you have an uh, yeah an organization that yeah, we can get it. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation about well, who's Jeff, supporting it. It's a country exactly that like... was bolstered by piracy. The whole country, right. it was the whole economy was built on the misallocation of certain copyrights and trademarks. Yeah, it's um infringements. Yeah, it's like if you, it's kind of like, you know, they always say the fox watching the hen house. Have you ever looked to see who runs the United Nations Security Council, Jeff? Do you ever see who's involved with that? Oh, yeah, the Human Rights Commission. Oh, that's the people that shouldn't, be, it's kind of like misappropriation, uh, like a, a whole workshop in misappropriation. <laughs> it's like mental you, intellect. Right. It's like null and void of any sort of like logic or reason. Doesn't make any sense at all. But they're like, hey, wait a minute, you guys are the biggest offenders. Why don't you guys run point on, on security, right? And why don't you guys we'll have well, China over here run point on uh you know um the environment and piracy. maybe India can yeah, the piracy. Well, you guys watch out for piracy, right? The whole thing is absolutely insanity, man. And uh well, we're not talking about pirates that run around with like no uh, piracy. Yeah, piracy like is copied. You know and all that stuff and i think it's a good idea to remind people guys please like subscribe click that notification bell that way you guys get notified and jeff you know what's interesting so yeah today i was looking at our because we have guys we have a podcast too we always use to plug the podcast but we have not even 10 percent subscribers it's nine percent subscribed based on how many people listen to our podcast and the, for the for the notification bell, we're somewhere between twenty and twenty five percent for the notification bell. But on the podcast, the people that actually follow the podcast, it's nine percent, which is kind of weird to me. But anyway, you guys can find us. Um, we're night, Sophie. Right, so if you have a good one, you have a good one. So and uh, yeah, so I'm just saying, you know, you can go ahead and subscribe. You hit that like button and that notification bell, and then you know. Then also, of course, follow us on Twitter. That's growing. It's at on the chain with underscores underneath there, and hopefully we'll be able to change that soon. By the way, I reached out to the guy, and guys, I don't want you to do this. Don't take this the wrong way, but I did reach out to the guy at Chip and said, "Hey, dude, I noticed you don't tweet that much, and you just ha kind of beat me to the punch by a few months." Which you know would you mind giving up you know your your handle since you're not big and he kind of wrote me back a message like no man i'm not going to give this up and i was like he's not even a guy that tweets a lot i was like now if you were like a guy that was like really big into the you know the whole thing 
just happen to get that chip faster than me. That's all how it works, you know? Chip, so Jim D has a topic of interest to cover in one of these upcomings, but we need a talk chat video on best way to use on and off ramps to and from crypto fiat without triggering compliance red flags. So what we need for that is a CPA mm -hmm. that specializes yeah, in cryptocurrency. I don't feel qualified no, to talk either. about that part of it. I can talk about the best way to use on and off ramps, the rest of it, not so much. <laughs> but that's but everyone here knows the best way to use on and off ramps. But that important part is without triggering compliance red flags. That's interesting. No, um, it is and that's something sure. that uh, the CPA, you know, could definitely, you know, talk about. Sure, CPA comes on, it wouldn't be financial advice. Got to consult with your own CPA, but it would be very interesting to, uh, we have to find somebody like that, Chip. There's in this space right now, if people, a couple listening, people out there, yeah, somebody must know somebody that's a CPA specializing or at least has a I know deep somebody. understanding of crypto. Yeah, I know somebody that's very steeped in it. I'll have to see if he's uh, interested in coming on the chain. That'd be very cool. He, he's, uh, he's, he's he's done a lot of work in the area, and I uh, had a clubhouse a chat with him. Nice. Back Plus, Chip, crazy. your boy Pump. My boy Pump can tell us how. Buy pizza, Bitcoin pizza. Anyway, that's all we got for you guys tonight. Um, we are going to get out of here, become sophisticated people. We need pass. We need uh, OTC passports. Yeah, that's right. We only have sophisticated, epic, sophisticated epic. people here in OGC. Sophistication. All sure. right. Let's get out of here, Jeff. Oh, is Let's that go. it? Is it time? Has that been an it's hour? Time. It's Holy over an hour. Cow. Hey, you guys know that we stream six days a week, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Sunday through Thursday, and every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And with that, Chip, tomorrow's another night. It's Tuesday, and we'll be back at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on the chain. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.